Next up, we have a panel discussion. Um, don't come up yet. So his name is Eric Roberson, and we also have Kim Clary. And to introduce Eric, he is a Chicago native, and he, I'm sorry, he's a really close friend of mine. Um, he's really young, he's close to our age. Um, I'm, I'm also pretty young. And uh, even, what, you, what? But despite his age, he's done substantial work in Chicago with the youth there. Um, right now, he is the program outreach coordinator with Hope Worldwide. So we have Eric and Kim Clary is the Director of Client Success at Odyssey Teams and she passionately connects like-minded organizations through revolutionary philanthropic experiences, um, which is kind of what was talked about in the fireside chat. So let's welcome them up. Thank you, Gia. Awesome, well we are here to talk about uh, humanitarian aid and social impact. And uh, you know, Kim, I've been able to get to know you over the past few days just uh, in preparation for this talk. Um, but would you mind just uh, explaining to the audience kind of who you are and what you do and just the journey to get there? Sure, um, like Eric said, my name is Kim Clary. And when I was about your age, 16, 17 years old, I lived in a little small beach town called Santa Cruz, which many of you have probably visited. Being from the Bay Area, I was born and raised there. And at about you know, junior, senior year of high school, I said, there is nothing for me to do here besides surf. I mean, I love doing that, and so did my friends. But I saw a lot of people getting involved in other not so constructive things outside of surfing, drugs, alcohol, crime, all of that stuff. And at 16 years old, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool if there was somewhere for me to go and for my colleagues to go that wasn't a church and it wasn't a party, like something in between that would resonate with my, with my peers. And I didn't have anything like that. And at that age, I didn't have this forum of people that were older than me that were gonna stand behind me and start something. So I kind of sat on that for a couple years and when I was about 22, I didn't come to a conference like this so I didn't know I shouldn't start my own nonprofit, so I did. I started a nonprofit in Santa Cruz and ran it for about 10 years, and it was anchored in really empowering youth and rewarding them for positive behavior instead of waiting until they were off on the wrong track and then um, trying to steer them back. So that was my roots. Again, for about 10 years, I did that. And then my mentor, which kudos for Adam to recommend you guys all find a mentor, because my mentor recommended that I come and work for the company I work with now. It's called Odyssey Teams, and it leverages philanthropy in the training room of these large corporations, like one of our clients is Google, Genentech. Um, what is that? Oh, well, we don't have any slides, we're just hanging out. Yeah, we're good, I think so. I like the power though. Um, <laughs> so now I am in a position at the company that I work for to bring philanthropy to these large corporations and to help create a, vis a, a visceral, a visceral emotional connection to themes like collaboration, communication, um, communicating across silos. So it's kind of two birds with one stone. Yeah. And I want to hear about you. So Eric and I just met like last week. So this is actually like us really getting to know each other yeah, a little exactly, bit. Exactly, so exactly. I want to hear a little bit about your story. Super impressive. I won't take the thunder away from you. So take Excellent. it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing. I'm excited to uh, ask you some questions after, definitely. Um, but a bit about myself. Uh, you know, I grew up very sheltered. I was homeschooled. Um, I grew up in the suburbs. And to top it all off, uh, the name of the street I grew up on was Talala, which is kind of like a pretty soft name. Uh, I wasn't proud of it. I'm a little embarrassed to even uh, bring it up here. But uh, my dad was actually a school teacher and, uh, in, in inner city uh, Chicago. He's currently a teacher as well. And he would always come home and uh, share stories just about um, the students' lives and how uh, just the challenges that you'll face in inner city Chicago. So I kind of always had that in the back of my mind growing up on uh, Talala Street. And, uh, you know, I went to college and I really wanted to get involved um, in similar work, uh, similar work as my father. And I just, the more I got close to different nonprofit organizations, the more I realized that, man, there's a lot of challenges out there, uh, even within the organizations themselves. And uh, a lot of them were, were chasing uh, funding and it was tough for them to even uh, keep their doors open, the ones that were doing really good work 
um, and stay sustainable because, man, they're all kind of going after the same funding, which has kind of been a common theme that we've been discussing. Um, so, you know, I, I, I knew I wanted to do something. So after college, I actually moved uh, from Tlala Street to the hood, and I just really fully immersed myself into, uh, you know, the lifestyle that I was hoping to, to help and change. And, uh, you know, I lived in a pretty dangerous neighborhood for a period of time, but I uh, ran into uh, who is now a mentor of mine who, who hired me, and I started working with an organization called Meta24. And uh, this program helps um, students who are disengaged in school, uh, they're, you know, maybe they're not coming to school. Um, it helps them get re-engaged by uh, starting their own businesses and learning through that. So uh, the program is actually very successful and they were able to, op able to open a brick and mortar store down the street and uh, even an online store as well. But it was just, it was great to be a part of an organization that kind of had uh, figured out the solution a little bit to a self-sustaining model where they're not as dependent on grants, right? Because they have these students who are, are generally producing income and starting their own businesses and um, becoming self-sustainable. Um, fast forward a little bit, I started uh, work with an organization called Hope Worldwide, and uh, I've been able to um, kind of connect both Goodler and uh, Meta24 by uh, utilizing Goodler to sell these youth entrepreneurs products, uh, which has been a really cool uh, model because these young entrepreneurs who society maybe was looking down on before are actually now giving back to their very own community through selling these products um, to organizations, for example, uh, like one in uh, Chicago called New Moms that helps uh, youth mothers in tough situations get back on their feet. So, I mean, these young entrepreneurs are going from, you know, getting in trouble to providing soap to, to people in need in, in their own community. So can, can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, we're speaking in generalities right now about social impact and, and the background that you have, which is absolutely amazing. I mean, this dude's 23. I mean, he's already done so much with his life, so watch out for this guy. Um, but, but give us a little story, a little background maybe from Meta24 or, or Hope Worldwide that can kind of give us, give us some, some insight into what's going on. Sure, yeah, I'll give an example of uh, an event um, that my organization did and I was able to head up. Um, every year we do a program called Hope Youth Corps where people from all over the world come to Chicago and uh, they just serve. They come here and they, they team up with different partnering organizations. But um, we, we did a toiletry drive through this program and uh, we had you know over 400 youth come out to this event and they bought products on Goodler. Um, so example, they bought uh, soaps. Uh, the students also make uh, things like deodorant and uh, shampoos and even candles. And uh, they, um, at this event, they bought all these different products uh, online, virtually through Goodler. We didn't even have to bring the products and ha had a virtual toiletry drive, which is pretty fun. And uh, we wound up selling uh, $3,000 worth of toiletries. And it was great because it served a double purpose, right? It not only helped uh, New Moms organization by providing them the toiletries they needed, but it also helped these, these young entrepreneurs get jobs and uh, be able to have the accomplishment of helping their communities. And in fact, um, uh, there's another event recently in Chicago. It was a, a global summit for our organization, Hope Worldwide, and a Meta24 student uh, reached $1,000 in revenue um, for his candle business at this, at this uh, summit that we had. So it's great just providing opportunity uh, for the youth there through these kind of pop-up shop type style events um, that we have through, through our organizations using um, the Goodler model and uh, things of that nature. So, so what, what was that young young man's name? Uh, his name is uh, Cortez, and actually, you guys can find his candles online. Uh, candles by Cortez. Uh, it's uh, called Mzuzi Dot Solutions. You can talk to me; I can give you more of the information. And what it, what is? I mean, he sold a thousand dollars worth of candles. That's great, but how did it change his life being a part of that? Yeah. So, actually, uh, Cortez previously he rarely came to school you'd see him about uh you know once a week and really it was just to kind of check in with his buddies and uh he was having a hard time holding a job he was working at starbucks and uh he he had gotten fired but then he got his job back and he was really just on icy ground there but through this business he really learned the skills uh necessary to be employable he learned kind of the passion and drive and learned how business works and how it can apply to different areas of his life um, so he went from never coming to school to, um, I mean, I had to kick him out of my classroom every day, but uh, he, he would come to school all the time, even on Saturdays when we'd uh, put uh, Saturday programming on for the students. 
And uh, he's actually now a manager at Starbucks because of the different skills and uh, soft skills and things like that he's been able to accomplish, so. Yeah, Cortez, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, but I have, I have some questions for you. Um, wait, 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 I have one more. Oh, oh wait, you, you, got, you can ask me some, then I'm ask you. Mine's a good one. I'll, I'll <laughs> I went to that, great. Uh, yeah, I know that you mentioned before you started your own nonprofit. She, she's being modest. She's saying, uh, I'm accomplishing things at 23. She started her nonprofit at 22, which is uh, pretty phenomenal. It makes me feel like I'm behind. But, uh, you know, what, what was kind of the shift from the nonprofit world to uh, for-profit? What, what prompted that? I don't know if it was super intentional, but looking back, um, the impact that I wanted to have was more on a global scale. And given the small nonprofit background that I had, that was very local. I mean, I'm thinking of Elizabeth's talk about, about having global impact, but also starting at your community. I, I think I started at my community and now I'm looking more for that global impact. And my mentor pretty much dropped Odyssey Teams in my lap. And he said, this is a company that is made for you. They they take philanthropy like literally we were we partner with a nonprofit called the Ellen Meadows Prosthetic Hand Foundation, and they make parts for prosthetic hands like the fifty different pieces of plastic and metal that um, that will eventually change someone's life. And those hands have to get put together, and so we find the people to put them together. Those are our clients. Like for instance, all of the sales team that um, we worked in their onboarding for, for Oracle, and they needed an experience that was gonna teach them about collaboration. So guess what? They get to put all the hands together. They're the ones that are building these hands that are changing lives, and then we give them back to the nonprofit. The nonprofit then has the arduous task that I would love for you guys to talk about tomorrow of how to get those hands onto recipients, because that's a little bit um, harder, harder to do than it is to talk about. Um, so to answer your question more succinctly, we need money. Nonprofits need money. And, and so with the Odyssey Teams model is using corporate money, if you will, in the training room to attack social problems and also giving, giving the employees of those corporations some, some uh, takeaways as well. Excellent. Yeah, I've just been alerted that uh, we have time for one more question. So I'm going to assume that that means one more question for each of us uh, very quickly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my question for you um, you, you talked about how there's kind of a corporate shift, um, and I, I'm just curious, is it, is it moving, uh, generally speaking, moving more towards uh, the social impact model, or is it moving kind of further away from that? Thankfully, it's moving towards it, uh, and a lot of that is in part to young people like yourselves that want to be involved in corporations that are making a difference. So you're pushing from, from the workforce up to the decision makers, you're pushing that social change. So we're finding that companies want to engage their workforces not to just check the box of CSR, corporate social responsibility, I did it, check it, but how can we use that experience to engage our employees? Like I was telling Eric earlier, when you're, you start work with a company and they put you through a three hour training where you're building prosthetic hands for international landmine victims, well you as the employee go, this company is pretty dang cool. If this is what, if this is what they're gonna put me through and these are the causes that they believe in and that's coming back around to the company, they're not just doing it to make you feel better as an employee, but they're doing it because it affects their bottom line. If you stick around, they don't have to hire workforces over and over again every two years, then that affects the company's bottom line. So it's this very beautiful cycle of keeping our keeping employees engaged and the workforces right. from training over every couple years. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Okay, last question for you. Great. So we talked about um, nonprofits and you're like a little bit of an aversion to it. Um, why do you think that the sustainability model is so superior to the, to the conventional nonprofit model? Yeah, I think just uh, briefly, it just, it, it's kind of a common cycle for a nonprofit to, um, you know, they're, they're going after their mission, but they have to take pauses uh, often, you know, to fundraise. And sometimes that can even close down the, uh, the organization because they just don't have funding. Um, and then another one rises, but it's really, it's starting from scratch. So it's kind of this starting over, starting from scratch type thing when you really are super dependent on uh, other people's money and funding. So when you can provide something sustainable that you can, uh, you, you don't have to be so reliant on that. Um, it's definitely helpful. And even from like an ethical point of view, particularly in Chicago, if you're always depending on other people's uh, funding, you know, there's certain measurable outcomes that you have to hit in order to get funding. So um, some people may be tempted more to, you know, maybe fudge different numbers or um, ultimately wind up doing, you know, more harm than good because, well, I got to keep the doors open. Um, so I think 
if if possible, it's it's best to um, find a way to to be self-supporting as best you can, so as not to be dependent. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Okay.